You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. Hi, and thanks for joining me for a really special edition of Two Guys and a Lot of Wine. Once again, I'm back to having two guys with uh, my friend and wine guru, Mr. Uh, Eli Ross. And uh, thank you for joining me tonight. Thanks, Boz. My pleasure. Um, I'm excited. I think we've got some great lineup here. So. We do, and I've never done just a Pin Noir show before. And a lot of people will be seeing this show during the holidays, and even though the last few years I've done a thanksgiving theme show, um, I think these wines would pair very well with a lot of uh, foods for things. Yeah, I mean, I think there's you really can't go wrong, as we'll get to as we as we taste through these. There's so many different styles and flavors, but yeah, if you're into ham or turkey or even a roast, I mean, yeah, these these will work great. And what's also great is, and this was completely unexpected, we have a, a wine from four different mm -hmm. regions, which is always great to do because even though they're all Pinot Noirs, uh, we're going to get some distinct different tastes in each one of these bottles tonight, and uh, the price price points vary. Um, generally, I'll go over those at the end of the show, roughly. And uh, But I'm kind of excited because uh, uh, I'm a big fan of Pinot Noirs, and um, I'm looking forward to all these, and I have not had one of these on the table tonight. Well, and again, you told me before this is your 22nd show, I think. And, yes. And I'm impressed. It's sort of contrarian to have not done Pinot Noir at this point because you know, if you look at it as far as the growth in wine consumption in the U.S., it's really the grape that, that kind of did it, um, you know, kind of, as we'll get to later, the movie Sideways and all the the publicity around that and people gravitating towards real red wines and away from, you know, no offense, but the white Zins and, and that oh, sort of thing. Yeah, so. white Zin is a bad word when you say that <laughs> on the show. Um, actually, I, I take that. You said no cursing. So <laughs> we've actually had a Pinot Noir on the show, but never four Pinot Noirs yeah. and doing the distinct differences between different regions. So uh, I'm excited. I'm looking forward to start our first bottle tonight. Our first bottle tonight is a Beach Kite. It is a Chilean Pinot Noir. Some of you might be familiar with the 90 Plus label. This is actually one of their wines, um, not with their label on it, but I think they are part of the producer of this particular wine. And uh, Eli, which glass would you like me to use? I'm sure they'll use this one here. Yeah, and Chile is, I think, better known for some of the, you know, Cabernet Sauvignon and some of the, uh, um, you know, some of the, the bigger wines of that, that type. But uh, what I think is, as we got to before, one of the things that makes this so popular and, and people have been able to exploit its popularity is how it can be grown literally all over the place, even in colder weather climates, um, places like the Finger Lakes in New York, they can, you know, they can do a, a, their version of Pinot. Um, they say it's one of the more tougher grapes to uh, cultivate, though, and actually make a good wine. I think, yeah, it's one of those things, it's, it's easy to make one, it's hard to make a great one, right? I mean, and because of that exact reason, that it's very fickle, um, you know, even in famous places like Burgundy in France, where it all started, they they have vine vintages where you know the, the wine's terrible just because of the variation that you get and the, the right. fickleness. So, and the the Pinot Noir grape itself is, I think, part of some of the best wines in the world generally, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, some of the most expensive wines in the world and most collectible are Pinot Noirs from uh, from Burgundy. Um, but uh, but really, you know, I, I think the. The, the Americans were, were one of the first to really pick up on the fact that they could do it. And in Oregon, we have one of those here as well as California. Yeah, I'm excited so. about those. And I should also let our viewers know, even though I've, I've done a, a Riedel show in the past and a wine, a wine glass show in the past, Eli will be using a, a Riedel glass. I'll be using, those of you familiar with my infamous uh, aerating wine glasses from Italy. Um, the, the verdict is still out on whether these are actually worth money or not. Um, yeah, but, they almost uh, look like racing stripes. I'm sure there's some scientist that went into the. Uh, yes, Italian <laughs> scientists actually. Like, it's only in Italy when they come Italy, up with something right. like this. So, let's give Cheers. this a shot. All right. Interesting nose. Mm. 
Yeah, I think as we suspected when we were lining these up, this one is, it is on the lighter, more delicate side. Very um, delicate, very yeah. light. Um, it does have the peppery finish, which mm -hmm. I've heard about. Mm -hmm. This is a, a classic example of somebody who's just getting into a Pinot Noir and might not want to be too offended by um, an overload of flavor. This might be something that they can try first. Yeah, and I, and I think what you what you get here is, as you said before, sort of the the, the delicate and then more um, you know less overpowering qualities of it. Um, it's very drinkable, certainly, and and but you know if you're thinking food pairings, I think to the, me this one is is going more towards. Um, Sweeter meats, lighter, you know, salmon, things yes. like that. You know, it's. Um, I think a good comparison or a good way to analyze this one would be uh, um, using the analogy of good day, my lady. Very calm, sophisticated, yet not too overpowering. Um, I'm sure as we get through the other Pinot Noirs, we might get something that's as strong as a, a Dothraki horde coming into uh, <laughs> to invade um, uh, some land on so a Game of Thrones. So a couple minutes, we already have a Game yeah, of we, Thrones Yeah, I had to get a Game of Thrones <laughs> reference, and I couldn't help myself. But uh, this is aged in stainless steel and, and French oak for mm -hmm. six months. And... Um, whether or not that contributes to some of the flavors we're tasting here. Yeah, I mean, the oak, I mean, you, you, you can definitely pick that up, and, and that's pretty, I think that's a common thread, at least among the two that I brought, or also have some French oak treatment that's pretty standard for Pinot. I don't think the American oak that you'd associate with like a cab or one of those really buttery Chardonnays, right, is, is not as prevalent in this style. But, um, but yeah, no, this is, this is very nice. It's very drinkable, and the price point is very reasonable. Um, this particular one you can find... Uh, I believe I found this out in Avon, but if you look online, it's generally under the $12 price point, which is a certainly for, I think, the flavor I'm getting here, I think is a very fair price. I wouldn't be disappointed if I got this at a restaurant. Yeah, I think the, the dominant profile you get is kind of a tart cherry, black cherry, which, you know, as you go, as you kind of go up in complexity or in different regional regions, you pick up more um, other kind of flavors and aromas start to be layered in. So hopefully we'll pick that up as we as we make our way through Which this. we should, because like I said, this first one was from Chile. Our next one we'll be going into momentarily is from France. And as my viewers know, I still love my French wine. So I'm very curious to see what kind of flavor profile mm -hmm. I'm going to get out of this. And especially when we get into the uh, the two Americans. Absolutely. Yeah. But uh, what is, uh, any? have you purchased any yourself Pinot Noirs for I the mean, holiday season? Uh, um, I pulled some out and this, this one on the left, or at least on, on my left here, um, the Saint Innocent from Oregon. I, I grew up in Oregon, so I'm a little, maybe perhaps just a wee bit biased. That's um, fine. And uh, I'd encourage anybody that wants to visit a beautiful wine country. The Oregon wine country is as close to Portland as Napa is to San Francisco. It's it's you know rolling hills and and uh, but this is the dominant uh, grape type that you'll see out there. There's some Pinot Gris, some Chardonnay, um, a few mix in of smaller. But this is you know this is the this is what put Oregon wines on the map is this this varietal. So. Um, so yeah, that, that I, as we talked about, um, you know, for Thanksgiving, this is a, this is really a go-to, such a food-friendly wine, very flexible. Um, well, that's always important because you're eating so much food on the holidays, and especially during the holidays. Even though I still love my wine, I don't like too heavy of a wine. Mm -hmm. And uh, generally, a, a good Pinot Noir, at least the first one that I've had, I think would pair very well with a heavier meal, so you're not getting too overpowering of a flavor with the wine. Yeah, they t I mean, th these wines in general, uh, the California may be a little exception. They, the way they ripen, they don't tend to ripen to the level of um, alcohol strength that you would say get out of a you know, Shiraz or Syrah mm -hmm. or, or a Grenache or one of those kind of um, more hit you over the head type of grapes, which are great as well. But, um, but I think, again, that's the beauty of this is, is really its versatility. That's yeah, what, I, I understand what you're saying. You know, I'll let you finish that and I'll give a brief description of what we're going to be drinking next. It's uh, Albert Boucher. Bourguignon Rouge, it's a Pinot Noir, um, it's a 2011. Um, it's 25, 35 year old vine parcels planted in clay and limestone, they're hand harvested. And I think the wine is aged uh, between eight and 12 months in steel and oak. Um, so we should definitely get a different flavor profile right off the bat, as, we, as I would expect for a French wine anyways. Um, so we shall see. All and right. it's a beautiful bottle, so to bring over to uh, somebody's house, if you're going for uh, a holiday meal, Thanks, Bob. Yeah, the uh, you know I think a lot of viewers may know this, but one of the things that kind of scares people away from French wines in particular is the trying to decipher the labels. And typically, if you go looking for something that says Pinot Noir from France, it's going to be hard to find. Because, that is, that's very true. You know, it's it's really all driven by what they they call the appellation, which is sort of the could be the village or the the local region where they make the wine. Now, this level, the Bourgogne, is is sort of their 
um, kind of broader based. It doesn't have to, it's more of a generic. It doesn't a generic mean, tone, yeah, right. sort of like the Bordeaux region and stuff like right, that. Right, exactly. So, um, but within that region, um, you know, they're, you know, they probably, they're almost certainly restricted to making, you know, there's this type of uh, basically a Pinot driven wine as opposed to, you know, the, the, the rules are still more uh, formalized, I guess, in France than, than over here. So, And I, I have some friends that don't necessarily like French wines because it's a little earthy sometimes, mm -hmm. more, which mm -hmm. I actually enjoy. I like the earthiness of a, of a French wine. And let's see if this is earthy itself. Distinctly different than the first one. Mm -hmm. No question mm -hmm. about it. Yeah, it's not quite as, um, it's a little more hesitant on the nose, not quite as in your face in, in sort of that floral way that the other one was. But but you definitely, I think you're getting, um, you know, more uh, fuller mouth feel, you know, definitely has some more weight to it. It does. It also has a little bit uh, interesting aftertaste compared to the first one, which sort of just dissolved. I didn't get the kick in the jowls. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, I love saying jowls when we get the wine <laughs> on the show. Uh, this one, you definitely get a little. Yeah, there's some tannins inside. in here. It's not, I mean, this again, this is not the, uh, you know, a, a cab or something that's just going to, you know, brace your mouth type of thing. But this is, yeah, this has got some structure. Could, it could, this could age for a couple years. Definitely. And this probably should have opened up a little yeah. bit longer than I've opened it up here on the show. And obviously, due to the constraints of time and we all work, you know, I just opened these up recently. This probably can benefit from maybe being opened an hour beforehand. Um, but uh, I think this would make a great entry-level French Pinot Noir for the average person who didn't want to be uh, shocked or uh, have their palate sort of overpowered. Yeah, you talk about opening up, and one of, you know, to, to ratchet up the snob meter a little bit, one of the things that you don't normally see people, even with really old Pinots, do is decant them because they are fairly, um, you know, they're, they're elegant, sort of um, delicate wines. And so there's really not a big need to, to get all that aeration in there. And, and so go just opening it. So, so, so no offense against your glasses, of course. But oh, <laughs> absolutely not. I, I've had a lot of fun talking about these on the show. <laughs> and um, you're right, not every wine needs to be aerated to begin with. And there's still some wine professionals who would say no wine really mm -hmm, needs to be mm -hmm. aerated at all. Um, but a, a Pinot Noir like this, would it make a difference if it was just opened up? Like yeah, leave sure, it in the bottle? Bit. Yeah, sure, I'm sure a little bit more air. But certainly not decanter isn't necessary. Right, yeah, I think that would be overkill. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, do you have a lot of French Pinot Noirs in your collection at all? Um, I've bought some over the years. Um, I guess more importantly, I have lots of friends that do. So, I mean, that's, that's always nice to, 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 be, to have that as an option. So, um, but it's, it's one of those areas that, that even compared to, like, say, getting into Bordeaux, for example, Bordeaux is a lot more accessible. You learn a few producers. And in Burgundy, you could have, you know, a, a vineyard the size of this room, and there could be 30 people working on it. And 25 of them could make great wine. Five of them could be hacks. Or, you know, it's, so it's really complicated. And it's really expensive, prim primarily because the production is so small. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're not planting more vineyard land there. It's, it's you know, it, it really is constrained in that way. So. Well, they like that in France. They like their boutique feel with, uh, you know, small um, outputs at small vineyards, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, which obviously drive the price points up, but sometimes it's a, it's a well-deserved high Right. Price in, in Burgundy, the, the scarcity is not manipulated in the way that it is in some places, you know, even in Napa, where you see wines that they make 30,000 cases of that are 120 a bottle or something, that there's really no logic behind it other than that they can... Because the they can. Right, exactly. They can do it. So. <laughs> and that, that's one thing that's changed about the wine industry, obviously, you know, compared to, you know, we were talking earlier, Eli and I, about the, some of our favorite wine movies. There's obviously Sideways. I just watched Bottle Shock again probably for the third time over the weekend, and, uh, which is a great another introduction to uh, the winemaking industry in America. It's, in its simple form, it's still entertaining because it just gives you an idea of the love and the passion that went into producing some great early wines in, in America. Mm -hmm. And I think what's ironic about that movie in particular is that, you know, in a way that was celebrating such a such an epic uh, moment. But it, you know, I think if you looked at the wine consumption, was still the spike or the pickup in that was maybe still twenty years away. You're right. It was a very slow um, pickup from right. that. But I think the best part for a lot of people was just that we beat the French. <laughs> 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 yeah, I they, love my French wine, but it was fun. They certainly too. play up a lot of the shock, no pun intended, of all the <laughs> the, uh, the French winemakers and press and everything. So. Well, I have to say this, uh, you know, I haven't had a lot of French Pinot Noirs myself. This is probably only the third or fourth that I've tried. And uh, for the price point, once again, I think this is certainly very uh, accessible to our average viewer who, didn't, who is trying to get into wine without being too overwhelmed by both price point and complexity. This will still give you a nice flavor, and uh, it's a very enjoyable, easy-to-drink wine. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I'm, I'm impressed. Um, again, no, 
no offense against the first wine, but I think it, they, they're definitely, like you said, they're very different. Um, oh, you can no offense here. Yeah. If you don't like something, it's going to be thumbs up or thumbs down. <laughs> so you will be offending nobody. And actually, uh, I think our viewers like a little a disagreement sometimes. But the first two, even though I picked them out and I'm not being biased, I'm very pleased with them. Mm -hmm. This particular one, this uh, French Pinot Noir, is uh, usually uh, 15 under $15 price point, which uh, once again is a pretty reasonable price yeah, point. Yeah, and that's about what you're going to be looking at, I think, for a, for a um, you know, a, even a, that level of uh, French Pinot Noir. So, um, you don't, because of the reasons I mentioned before about the, you know, you just don't get the yields and the, you can't just plant this stuff anywhere. Um, you don't see the 7 or $8 Pinot Noirs generally. Then you're, then you're down into Beaujolais, which is kind of a relative, actually, which may, most people may not know, but it's a, it's a neighboring region in France. And the the Gamay grape, which makes up uh, Beaujolais, is is a close relative to Pinot Noir as far as where it's grown. So, well, uh, that's very interesting. And like I said, I think people uh, will take some of that information and hopefully use that for their buying choices when they go into a store. But I got to be honest with you, Eli, I'm anxious for our next one. All right, let's do it. And let's even though it. it's a twist off, there's nothing wrong with that yeah. nowadays. Yeah, it reminds me of uh, I think we were at um, Hot Tomatoes in one of its iterations, and the the waitress came out with the wine, you know, screw cap, Not didn't realize it, and starts taking the uh, corkscrew to it, and we're like, uh, see you again. <laughs> so, probably doesn't happen as much nowadays, but. How long has the screw cap been around now? Is it 20 years or less than that? I, I think the, you know, certainly the, the alternative closures, I think the first was probably the, the rubber cork or artificial cork, and then this, this style of screw cap is, has been real prevalent in, the, yeah, definitely in the past 15 or 20 years. In certain regions, New Zealand, for example, I mean, it's hard to find cork finished wines because that's just what they. What My they only concern use. with the screw cap is the longevity. Can you store something for 30 years with a screw cap? That's yeah, I mean, the, the people, I think there's, get, there's enough time out there in screw cap to start to give some of that information. But let's face it, you know, 90% of the wines that are bought in the U.S. are people intend to consume them within a year or two. So, so if you factor that in and then, you know, the, the issues with. Um, the problems with cork that you know that do exist. That's true. There are it, problems. It, it does come into play. But so this wine, um, Lyric, um, is uh, it's actually made by Etude, uh, who's a fairly well-known producer in Sonoma, California, I believe. Um, but they source the grapes from uh, Santa Barbara County, which um, we mentioned uh, sideways. If you want to give me a glass. Yep. Um, and that movie uh, highlighted the exploits of some forty-something uh, uh, gentlemen in the Santa Barbara. <laughs> Uh, area and focused a lot on Pinot Noir, and also made, took lots of pot shots at Merlot and you know and how which I really thought was know. kind of unjust because there really are some good Merlots out there. But uh. well, and you know, and, and the, the winemakers took or the movie makers, I should say, took liberties to uh, have a lot of inside jokes because if you remember the guy, the uh, the wine he was saving for his special occasion, the Cheval Blanc, is actually got a significant amount of Merlot in it, but it's <laughs> French and it's you know expensive and so forth. But so Santa Barbara. Um, is uh, you know as people probably know is is uh, is uh, north of LA a little bit and uh, this is uh, it's a different style than say um, the Russian River Sonoma County um, there this is where you get some really uh, really really ripe uh, Pinot you know um, the, bou the bouquet is actually stronger than our yeah. first two our first two tight and actually the color is much darker so you know the the issue or the the thing with a lot of these California Pinot Noirs especially say a Santa Barbara um, or some of the the their their neighbors is that you know, in a blind tasting you'd be hard you might get fooled by these which isn't a bad thing if you like the wine but but I think the first two most people um, you know that had tasted this style before would say yeah those are definitely Pinots but I'm not sure on this one. That's why I love doing this show, guys. Completely different flavor profile, completely different finish. Unlike the uh, the French, which sort of hit me in the jowls, this one lingers in the center mm -hmm. of the mouth. And that's why those of you who watch the show and are wine lovers, um, this is why I love wine because we're do, we're drinking Pinot Noirs, and each one has been so different on the palate. That's what I love. Absolutely delicious. Yeah, this is real nice, and um, you know, this is a it's a creative marketing too. When I was researching this wine, the first, the, the, the sheets I found on it said that they had intended it just to be for by the glass restaurant only. And most of the Etude uh, uh, vineyard designated Pinots, say from Sonoma, are, you know, they're maybe $75, $80 a bottle. So they're way out of the normal price point. This I think is retails for around 20. Um, and of course now it is available retail, um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, I, I'm, I'm real impressed. And um, the legs are really nice legs in there too. Yeah, no, it's, so this is one. I mean, it, when you talked to get, we talked food pairing earlier. This 
This one maybe, you know, you could even stand it up to some a beef dish or something like that, given that. This one, yeah, actually it's a little heavier than I would anticipate, but even though it was a little heavier than I anticipated, it's still the kind of a, a red that I would prefer during the holidays mm -hmm. when you have all that meat on the table. A lot of starch. Um, I think this would, would go very well with pretty much anything on the plate. Yeah. Yep. How did you find, find this one? Um, just blind grabbing at the store. Now, I, I, had, I, I had kind of, well, we'd, I had kind of known I wanted to do California, and, uh, um, and then I sort of gravitated toward the whole Santa Barbara thing, and this was one that, that met our price point, and, and there you go. So, and uh, is this available locally also? Yep, yep, yep. Well, great choice, great choice. And um, what do you think it is, and maybe because you're a little bit more technical than I am, what makes a certain wine hit you here and another wine hit you back there? What's going on in the complexity of the wine that, that changes that or makes that well, a different taste? I think the, uh, it has a lot to do with the, uh, the, you know, the, the sort of that tannin, that, that bracing nature of it, that kind of mouth puckering thing. And I think that... You know, overly tannic wine, it sort of can almost overwhelm the other textures that you might pick up otherwise. Mm -hmm. So depending on, and a lot of that has to do with how they age it and how they ferment it after it's picked. And so it's not, I mean, the grapes themselves, yeah, play a big role in that. But, um, you know, you, you're right. You can get, uh, you, you can get completely different experiences. And, and that's one of the big ones that, that drives out um, for the aroma, just because... In Pinot, there's such a wide variety of aromas. As there has been with each one. Right, and then the real, the mouth feel and that part of it is, particularly again, is if you're thinking of these as really food wines, is maybe not quite as important as it might be in a, in a Shiraz or Cab or, or something like that. But, um, but this one, again, certainly can stand up from, uh, from that. And, you know, taken to the extreme, this sort of style can be, you know, you can easily mistake these for Shiraz. Um, there's producers like Lauren and other that. people yeah. that, that, you know, and you can get really high alcohol contents and everything. And it's, you know, and one of the things growing up on the West Coast is just like, you know, there is in New England, there's rivalries between I'm Oregon sure and California. And this is one of the things of style that's so different. And it's course driven by climate, really, and the types of grapes that they plant. But, you know, we um, actually, quickly before we get to the next one, uh, we didn't actually talk about alcohol content for a Pinot Noir. And uh, I think they're generally about the 13% yeah. range, generally. Yeah, typically 13, 14. I mean, you're not going to see a... At least in normal styles, you're not going to see a 17 percent or anything like that. But well, Eli, great choice. I really enjoy this one a lot, and because it's so distinctly different, uh, that's another reason I enjoy it. Yeah, no, I, I, I mean, again, I took a took a flyer on this, and hey, it worked out. So. Well, we always try to drink things that I haven't experienced or my guest hasn't experienced, just so we can be a little bit honest when we're actually tasting them. Okay. So, so the next one is uh, is from Saint Innocent, which is a winery in uh, in my home state. Um, they're located outside of Salem, which is the, the capital of Oregon. Um, this is actually 2002, so I've, I've had been sitting on this one for a few years. I think it was actually released in 2004. Um, their wines are available if, uh, if the viewers are familiar with Table and Vine up in um, West Springfield. Yep. They carry St. Innocent. Um, you'll find them up there, obviously, you know, recent release vintages. Um, and this one, at the time, was I think was in the maybe low 20s. Uh, but they have some. They have some that are in the fifteen dollar range as well, and then and then typically most of their wines are in the thirty ish range. So well, there's two um, things I have to point out that I noticed right off the bat when you pour this. The color is much more bricky. It's a definitely heavier color, and the the aroma from this. Yeah, this um, is probably the earthiest yep, one. Yeah, I was going to say, and that, this so this this particular wine, um, the vineyard it's sourced from is called Shea, which is. Uh, it's probably one of the most iconic vineyards uh, for Pinot out in Oregon, and it's been there since uh, it was planted in about 1990. Um, and they have they make their own wine, and I think from about 10% of the plantings, and about 90% they source out to um, Oregon and, and some uh, California winemakers as well. But Shea has a reputation of being a, a, a vineyard that produces wines that really can stand to age for eight or ten years. And this honestly is maybe, I mean, not based on how it's performing, but just based on reputation. You know, it's probably, it, you know, peaked maybe a couple of years ago just based on, you know, wine geeks on the Internet type of opinion. Well, that's but. actually important to let our viewers know because, you know, I, usually when I buy wine, I either buy several bottles and keep one for future use and, you know, drink the other ones. Uh, a, a bottle like this, even at this price point, which isn't what you would call extremely high, you can still sell her something like this, like you did, mm -hmm. but you can't sell her indefinitely. Yeah, and I, and I think that's, you know, that's, that's where... Um, going out there and researching other people's, either professionals or just the average Joe's opinion, 
Uh, that's what's great about the internet is you can find people that have tasted through these wines that you have if there's ones that you do want to lay down and you're not just kind of rolling the dice. Um, but this is, you know, this is, this is good. Uh, yeah, I got to say, this is, once again, people, um, completely different flavor profile. Every one tonight yeah. is completely unique. I don't think own. we could have done, the, you know, we, if we tried, we probably couldn't have come up with four more different wines. I would um, say for, for what I enjoy in a wine, uh, the terroir, the, the, the soil characteristics of this one is probably the strongest mm -hmm. out of the three, which I actually like. Now, some people might not like that. I actually do because it tells me a lot about. Yeah, and like you said, that, that earthiness, which some people find off-putting. Mm -hmm. And you got a little of that, I think, in the French. Uh, the Cal California, it was, maybe if it was there, it was more overcome by just the, the how rich it was, the textures and stuff. So, um, but here it's there in spades and... Um, um, but yeah, and I'll do, I hope you don't mind, you know, a little product placement or plugs. I did, uh, I told my friend that, uh, that stored this for me all these years, um, that I would, that I would mention his, uh, Horse Ridge Cellars is the facility that I use and it's one of the biggest in, uh, in New England. So in Northeast actually. So, so this has been temperature controlled for all Temperature controlled, yes, for 10 years or something like that. Um, and, uh, that facility started as a fallout shelter or, or a nuclear bomb shelter actually in the Cold War and, and was repurposed as a wine cellar. And that is phenomenal. Yeah. Peace, love, and wine. That's, That's absolutely. <laughs> it's not exactly my political alienation, but uh, um, I still like the fact that they were able to use something that was used for destruction for wine enjoyment. And, and if you know, it's one thing too that out of sight is out of mind. That's one of the great things about off-site storage, right? Is that you don't have that temptation of say, oh, you know, it's a Thursday night, and you, know, you can have a few bottles around. But but this, you know, it, it takes. I got you. Got to be purposeful about it, which which is good if you want to lay something down for Well, in years. the past, we've talked about wine storage, and I know it's not easy for a lot of people. A lot of people just buy wine the day they're going to drink mm -hmm. it. Um, but, you know, there is some science to it. You do obviously don't want to keep wine in a hot spot. If you can keep it in your basement at a regulatively sane, consistent temperature. Yeah, that's, uh, well, you know, what I do is I have, you know, a wine fridge, and then we have passive in the basement, and then for the stuff that I know I'm not going to want to touch for five or ten years, I leave it out at Horse Ridge, and, you know, it, it works out, yeah. Well, our remaining few moments of the show, Eli, I just want to thank you for bringing two great bottles tonight. I'm really glad I got to do just a one varietal, though I did do a Chardonnay show with, with Kalen, Kalen yeah. Lawler, a few uh, episodes back, which was a lot of fun. But to do a Pinot Noir show um, was, was fantastic, especially during the holidays that are coming up and the people are going to be watching the show. And please research. I'll put these up on our Facebook page. Try them. You won't be disappointed. Um, I don't think any of the wines we drank tonight you'd be disappointed at all. Yeah, that was, it was really my pleasure. And, and I think the, the wines, as I said, uh, um, you, you really kind of span the globe, um, both literally and, and, uh, and from a wine standpoint. So. And actually, uh, like you said earlier, I mean, a Pinot Noir is available from a lot more regions than we just have here tonight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So once again, Eli, I want to thank you for being on the show tonight. I want to say thank you to my viewers who have kept me around for almost three years now. And I uh, hope everybody has a safe holiday. Have a great holiday. Eat a lot of turkey, drink a lot of wine <laughs> safely. And uh, until next time, keep us both in your oh, wine, wine cellar. cellar.